all the things that my daughters wanted to invest in were things that they absolutely knew. You know, so a lot of investors will hear about a stock or a company and they'll just go and invest in it because someone said, oh, it's I made a lot of money. But no, you really should invest in what you know. You two co-wrote a book called Seven Secrets to Investing Like Warren Buffett. In it, you have a wonderful Warren Buffett quote. You really don't need to use leverage. If you're smart, you're going to make a lot of money without borrowing. What is it about leverage that attracts so many investors and why has Buffett managed to stay away from it? Well, I don't, I mean, borrowing money for Warren just isn't a good idea. I mean, because I think he, you know, with the small amount of money that he has or that he, anyone has, he can make money with that money rather than, I mean, if you're borrowing money, you're paying. And um, I, I just don't think it's something that he would ever do. Uh, I've never known him to, to talk about borrowing money. Um, so with ever, whatever money he has, he would just invest it. And whatever money he makes on that, um, he continues to build it. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I've never known him talk about borrowing money or to think about borrowing money. I just think it's too too unattractive for him. You know, with regard to that, I I wish that I've heard that quote much earlier before I started investing. Uh, Embarrassed to say, when I first started, I actually borrowed money to invest. Uh, In Singapore, there's this particular investment tool called Contract for Differences, where you can leverage up to seven times your capital and guess what? I was attracted. And back then, I think that I wanted to have that kind of leverage so that I can make money fast. I can just put 10000 in and I can invest up to 70000 worth of uh, equities, thinking that if they double within, uh, let's say, a week, that's where I can use 10000 to make another additional $70,000. Uh, but well, I guess we all know how the story goes. I wipe out my account very quickly and I tried jumping onto the next uh, instrument, which was... Forex trading at that point in time. And they allow me to leverage up to 1 is to 1,000. Meaning you say I can put a certain amount in, I can leverage up to 1,000 times. And guess what? Uh, I burst my account again. And the more times I burst the account, the more I desire leverage so that I can make the money back fast. It becomes like a revenge trading or revenge investing. Uh, on high side, I realized what Warren mentions, uh, what, what, it makes, what, what he says makes sense. Because if you are good at investing, it is not that you do not leverage. It is that you use smart leveraging. When I studied Warren, I realized that he leverages a lot, but he doesn't do it by borrowing money. He does it by buying insurance companies because it's a different kind of leverage. That's where he right. buys into companies that gives him float. And with that float, he's able to use it to invest and make even more revenue. And he, he doesn't take on the risk of having to return the money. And you have to be correct within a certain time frame, if you borrow money. And once you borrow the money, interest kicks in. That's where it goes against you. Before you start, you have already lost. So I guess, right. when you talk about leveraging, there, there, there are good kinds of leverage. There are silly kind of leverage. And conventionally, most of us, we use the silly kind. Yeah, that makes, that makes complete sense. So part of what makes Warren Buffett such a great investor is that he, broach, he approaches investing from a business-like perspective. Well, let's say an aspiring investor wants to invest in stocks with a business-like attitude, but has zero entrepreneurial background. What would you suggest they do outside of, you know, reading a bunch of business books and biographies of business greats? Uh, I remember, in fact, I took a, a page from your playbook. I remember Mary told me a story that when uh, her kids were much younger, she told them to just like invest in a certain portfolio based on, I remember you told me, in the past, it was a newspaper. They have all the stock ticker and you ask them to really select certain stocks. And they select like, I, I think you mentioned pure berries and, and stocks that they know. Interestingly, Hagen-Dazs. last year, uh, Hagen-Dazs, correct. And, uh, and you, you mentioned that you wish that you have actually bought those stocks. So taking a page from the playbook, what I did last Christmas when, was I asked my kids to buy stocks and they bought three stocks. Uh, I, I, the portfolio wasn't very big. I gave them $1,000 so they couldn't build a huge portfolio. They bought three stocks, Disney, because they, they like 
Disney, uh, uh, all the Marvel heroes. Second one, they bought into Netflix because they see me watching Netflix a lot of time. Now, I, I listen to the podcast as well, but I, I spend time watching Netflix. And the third one was uh, Alphabet because they use a lot of YouTube. And guess what? The portfolio is already up by 50% uh, since last year, December. So I realized that when we talk about buying stocks as an investment or a business perspective, you do not really need to read a lot of business books. My, my, my kids didn't read business books, but they understand business as a consumer. So I think that's, that's where we, we talk about that. So I, I remember you mentioned that, right, Mary? About them doing the P-E ratio. Yeah, I mean, it's what's very interesting about your story is they bought what they know. You know, I mean, they they understood and know all three of those companies that they're talking about buying. And I think that's really important for investors to remember is, you know, a lot of people, you hear about stocks or businesses that other people are talking about, but you don't really know them. And people have invested in in companies and stocks that they didn't know anything about. And I think that's completely crazy. You really should know what you're investing in. If you're using it, or even better, you know. But uh, like I said, you know, haagen Burger King, all the things that my daughters wanted to invest in were things that they absolutely knew. You know, so a lot of investors will hear about a stock or a company and they'll just go and invest in it because someone said, oh, it's I've made a lot of money. But no, you really should invest in what you know. Yeah, agreed. So Buffett still lives by uh, many of the principles that he's learned from Benjamin Graham, especially in regards to investing with a margin of safety, the Mr. Market analogy, and the business owner's mindset. But a lot of Buffett's investing has evolved from Graham's net nets to investing in high quality businesses like you know Apple. So if Buffett started today with the prevalence of growth companies and intangible assets, do you think he still would be drawn to the traditional low price to earnings, low price to book style of value value investing? Yeah, I do. I think it's, you know, um, uh, traditional low PE and PB styles of investing are... um, are very good. Theory. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was looking back at uh, the history of the how this whole thing originated when Buffett, when Warren uh, learned from Benjamin Graham, one of the key things was net-net. And he was looking at a company's asset value, uh, net current asset value, and trying to buy below the price. So that's a huge margin of safety. I think this is one way of evaluating whether a company is below value. Okay, if you can buy below value, excellent. Another way of looking at things, which people, or, or conventionally people call it uh, growth investing, is to compare the current value to, to future value. If you can see a potential future value shift, this is with a lot of, uh, I would say, assumption and prediction. That's why it's important to buy into predict- predictable companies. And you see that as a future, like this company is going to be like five times bigger. Well, this is also considered undervalued. If you ask me to make a calculated guess, which one will he use right now? I, I got a feeling it will be, it will be like, a, like a mixture of both. It will not be one or the other. Because looking at his portfolio right now, you do see him buying into banks, right? Like I think he invested heavily into different like heavy asset uh, uh, investments like banks or even like oil and gas companies. And these are he- heavily, I would say, asset-based. At the same time, he also, I mean, his biggest holding is Apple, which is, is it about 50% or 60% right now? This is a growth company, but it's, a, it's still a mixture. So I guess he's, he, he doesn't have to be either. That being said, in my opinion, I've also realized that the valuation of the market has generally rise over the years. I guess it's because there's more participants in the market. And that, when there's more participants, the PV ratio, the PV ratio has, has re- risen to a certain uh, higher level. So to find it, like maybe two-thirds of uh, the current asset value may not be as easy. That, that's my opinion. Even with, uh, let's say, stock screeners and things like that. I, that that's, that's what I think. Yeah. Makes sense. So, Sean, um, as a value investor who's well-versed in technology, I'm interested in knowing your favorite method of finding new stock ideas. In the book, you mentioned some great ideas such as leveraging your circle of competence, tracking the super wealthy, Uh, looking at data to find the best companies, using your shopping mall to generate new ideas, which you just mentioned, and how to clone other value investors. 
I'd love to know what your favorite methods are and if there's any new technology you're using to help you find new ideas these days. Okay, so I do talk about using screeners, uh, using certain websites, or in recent years, we can even use uh, AI. It's just interesting the kind of ideas I can give you. Like you can, I, I, I tried using, uh, asking ChatGPT or even uh, Bart.Google. Imagine you're Warren Buffett. Right now, what are the kind of uh, undervalued opportunities they'll give you? And you'll be surprised what they can give you. Now, uh, that being said, right, using screeners, using websites, typically it is a one-off kind of strategy for finding stocks. Reason being, if I use a screener this week and next week, they typically give me the same ideas because the valuation doesn't change that much uh, over, let's say, one week or even one month. So I get some ideas here, but my favorite kind, right, is actually like what I mentioned, like how our kids choose investing. Invest in what you know. I bought Microsoft, I think, earlier this year when ChatGPT became something quite, I would say, uh, quite popular. And I'm thinking, wow, who owns this? And I realized Microsoft owns this. And I have a lot of assumptions, a lot of theories. I may be right, I may be wrong, but it, it pikes my interest. So I invested into Microsoft. Well, good news is, uh, went up, make money from it. So my, my favorite way is still really looking around. I think it's, it, it makes, okay, because I'm not someone who loves shopping. So it makes my, when I accompany my wife to the shopping center, it makes my life more bearable to like search for investment ideas while, while shopping with her. Uh, that's now, now one of my favorite met methods. Yeah, so I guess, you know, using your own experience and then maybe mixing that with just opening up your newspaper, a newspaper app and reading the news and seeing what, how those businesses are doing in the news would be a, a decent uh, starting point for someone. I love that. So, so one thing is when I read stocks that are in the news, I always feel that I'm slightly too late because it's already in the news. So what I do is I try to find either that particular company's suppliers or maybe competitors. Like example, uh, 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 something I remember way back was I think, I think was it Bill Upman, he was uh, shorting Herbalife. So the, the, the network company marketing, uh, network marketing companies industry was being affected. I, I, do not, I do not invest in the Herbalife, but I try to find the peripherals, those that are surrounding it. So I managed to find other companies and I thought it was a better investment. That, that, that's how I like to look at things. Yeah, I like that. So basically, you're just looking for uh, the baby being thrown out in the bathwater with one bad news <laughs> item and then just looking at the peripherals of what else is not yes. doing well. That's right. I like that. Um, so Warren has a brilliant mental model for determining if a business has monopolistic characteristics that Mary outlined in Buffettology. He'd ask, if an intelligent and able competitor had access to billions of dollars, could they start a business and successfully compete with the business? If you had to guess what percent of Warren's private and publicly owned businesses uh, he's purchased in his career had monopolistic tendencies? Well, I would say, you know, most of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you just think about it, you know, Coca-Cola, you know, the companies, if you look at the companies that Berkshire owns, most of them have monopolistic uh tendencies uh, you know um uh and you ask why did he go against this rule to buy non not monopolistic type businesses like airlines retailers and show manufacturers airlines were wasn't a good buy for him um we you know retailers well i mean the nebraska furniture mart He's from Nebraska. He knows the owner. Um, hmm. uh, it's it's just interesting. I mean, Nebraska furniture part is uh, there's nothing like it. I mean, people come from all over, the, literally the country, to go there to shop. It's a crazy place. <laughs> uh, so, huh. airlines, yeah. That wasn't a great buy for him. When you talk about being a mon monopolistic company, it is pretty subjective, I guess. So I think the indicators that we always look at in the buffetology, we talk about uh, net margin, okay, like gross, gross margin. Uh, the, the assumption is this. If let's say you have certain advantage over your other competitors, likely you are able to charge higher, uh, resulting in a higher margin or you're able to reduce costs significantly. So, so it's always back to the margin. So I guess 
I, I remember there was one, I couldn't remember the year, was it 2007 or 2008? There was a uh, previously, Warren bought a lot into IBM. And at his annual general meeting, someone actually asked him, he said, what, say, uh, like Warren, what, what, is the, what is the competitive advantage? What is the economic mode of uh, IBM? And I remember his, his reply actually shocked me. He said that, frankly, I don't know, but the number seems to suggest it has. That's <laughs> an like economic mode. So that's why I realized, wow, uh, it, is, it is really subjective. And uh, even, even Warren Buffett doesn't have all the answers. So, I mean, if it's really that's the correct answer, we will be able to do a, like a, it's like a black and white, right or wrong, binary kind of a, a thing. But it isn't. That's, that's why investing is so interesting. You have to make certain assumptions, make certain guesses, and make sure that even if you are wrong, you can, uh, you can take the uh, affordable losses. I, I guess that's how we play the game. That makes complete sense. Um, so Mary, you had a really good breakdown of uh, commodity type businesses that you wrote in Buffetology, which has been very helpful for me. And I'm sure a lot of other people who've read that book to help eliminate low quality businesses. So for businesses or for, sorry, for listeners not aware of what creates a commodity type business, they are low profit margins, low returns on equity, absence of brand name loyalty, presence of multiple producers in the industry, existence of excess production capacity and erratic profits and high dependence on tangible assets. So when Warren is analyzing a business, how quickly do you think he's able to determine a business's quality? No, I think, I think, I think he can analyze a company quickly because he chooses easy companies to analyze. So, so it goes back to the idea where you, you, don't, you don't go into something so complicated where you need to really frown and then really crack your head over it. If it's so difficult, maybe maybe it's not the investment you should invest in. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't do our due diligence, right, Mary? I think when we were talking okay. about Apple back in, was it 2017 or 16 when we were in LA, we were just looking and we said, Apple is a good company and we invested into, into Apple and a few months later, we saw Berkshire bu bu buying a lot of Apple. So he's thinking, oh, it, it becomes so obvious that it's a strong company. Uh, I, I, I believe investment should be like that. So I think, was it Peter Lynch that mentioned? If you cannot like illustrate the whole business using crayon, you shouldn't invest. Well, if there's, I mean, I, I, the, the principle behind it is it must be so simple to really understand the business, right? I mean, for me, I can't really draw anything with crayon by that token, I shouldn't invest, but it's, it's like the point. It's to keep things simple. Yeah, keep things simple. Yeah. So, Let's say, um, just going back in history, let's say Warren finds a business that he maybe finds interesting, but he deems it low quality right now. Um, does he like putting these types of businesses on a watch list just to watching, maybe seeing in the future if there's going to be a change in management or a change in business strategy that maybe it would become a viable investment later on in the future? No, I, I would say uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think if it's low quality now, um, it's uh, no, I, I, I don't think that management or the business changing is going to, no, not, not the future. No. I remember in your Tao of Warren Buffett, you, you mentioned something like, um, something like kissing frogs. People kiss frogs hoping that they'll turn into prints, but you just, you just, Kissing a lot of frogs just get your mouth uh, a bad taste. I can't remember the exact quote, but I, I remember it was in a town of Warren Buffett. So I guess like what Mary mentions, if it's not good, I mean, there are, there are plenty of good businesses around. So go, go for those, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I, I think you guys are both right on that. And it seems like, you know, sometimes he'll follow a super high quality business for a really long period of time. Like I know with, um, I think Occidental, he's followed that business for like 40 years and, and never bought it and just, I guess the price was right and he liked the opportunity, so he jumped on in. 40 years, like you said. I mean, what other investor do you know that you can say that about? Who follows a business for 40 years? Yeah, it's like, wow. <laughs> Absolutely. So Buffett has said, I think I can make you 50% a year on $1 million. No, I know I could. I guarantee that. I know many people in my audience's eyes got big when they heard this quote. Given all the research you two have done on Warren Buffett's history, can you outline what you think or guess what his strategy would be to accomplish this incredible rate of return? Uh, I, I, 
I I can't say. I mean, um, I think I could make you 50% a year. Well, um, yeah. You know, when, when, when he said that, right, I guess what he was trying to say is uh, there's a structural disadvantage having huge capital. Well, did he really make 50% per year? Uh, <laughs> you know, on high side, we can say a lot of things, right? Well, if I have $2, I can make 100% a, a year. I, I mean, <laughs> obviously... <laughs> Uh, obviously, I mean, Warren isn't someone who just shoot out statements like this as well. He has, he has indeed made like 100% a year, 50% a year. Uh, in the past, using the method of, uh, again, what Graham talks about. So he actually bought bus company, uh, knowing a certain exit point. He even actually done arbitrage before. He, he, has, he has a huge arsenal of weapons in, inside his whole investment uh, chest, correct? So is there one particular method I, I don't think so. And I also no. do not think when he say 50% a year, it means like every year, a straight line 50%. But if you give me 1 million, I can turn it into 100 million over a certain number of years. And when you compile it, it's like 50% per year. I, that, that's what I truly believe. So uh, let's let, hopefully the listeners can take this with a more, I will say, realistic expectation and not try to find a holy grail. I mean, I, I wish I can do that as well. I, I don't really think there's something like that. It is really a philosophy of believing in what you, 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 you are investing in and knowing that they will grow your money by a certain way. It, it's, it's an assumption. Makes sense. So some of the Buffett, uh, so sorry, some of the less Buffett-like investments Berkshire has made in their public portfolio recently are Newbank, which is um, trading at a PE around 711 with highly erratic free cash flows. Snowflake, which has never been profitable, but it's growing its free cash flows very quickly. And Stoneco, which also has a highly erratic profitability track record. Um, do you think Buffett has embraced tech, or are these more of a result of him handing off responsibility to uh, Ted Wexler and Todd Combs? I think absolutely it's Ted Wexler and Todd Combs. Uh, Buffett, you know, embraced tech? <laughs> no. I mean, uh, those definitely seems like, seem like Ted and Todd. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can't see Warren embracing that. But I, I think one thing that's consistent about what Warren does is he invests into the right people. So like even when you talk about Nebraska Furniture Mart or even uh, uh, quite, quite a number of it, okay, a guy called, he actually took control of it. But most of the time when he invests, he allows the management to continue to do it. So I guess when he has his two le lieutenant uh, that join him, like what you mentioned, New Bank or even, I think even Amazon or even like a certain, certain investment doesn't smell like a Buffett traditional type of investment. But the way that he gives them the freedom is exactly what he does. He, he allows them to do what, he, what, what they do and I mean, he takes it. So that's, that's what I believe. Sorry, that being said, when you talk about high P, it is not, it is not uncommon because even when you talk about uh, when he bought Nebraska Furniture Mart, so I remember he paid about 50 over million for it based on the revenue back then or even the profit back then. He was making about 1 million plus. So he was paying about 50 times PE ratio back then. But it was a private company. And it was even more uncommon because for a stock, for you to pay a, a high multiple, it makes sense. But for a private company to pay 55 times, it is unheard of. Uh, but what happens now is if you look at Nebraska Financial Mart, I do not have the latest numbers. If I remember correctly, I was reading it a few years ago. Every week, they are making 55 million. So he paid one time 55 million. Right now, he's really bearing the fruits. So he looks into the future. So it's, it's not uncommon to pay high P. But embracing tech, um, again, I'm, I'm not too sure as well. Yeah. So with, with the way that he has the, uh, the help set up from Todd and Ted, are they able to basically green light any investment on their own without even asking Warren first? I know Warren places a lot of trust in the people that he works with. Is that kind of the model that they have set up? I, I'm not too sure. I, I, I'm just imagining how he would do it. Because I... So, so I mean, this is the fun part where we always uh, discuss, me and Mary, we will discuss that. Um, I'm just... We, we didn't really ask Warren before, but I'm just thinking how he will groom the next generation. Uh, I guess... I guess it makes sense for them to like come up to him with the investment thesis and he will guide them through, question them, them uh, mentor them. I, I, would, I would assume that he will be a very good mentor. Looking at the way he, 
uh, his talks on YouTube and uh, the way he talks to people, talk, talks to us at the at the AGM. Uh, but whether he green light or not, I, I'm not really not too sure. I, I got a feeling that he will let them test their own things. And he mentioned this. He mentioned this before. He said that we can lose money, even a lot of money, but we cannot lose a single share of reputation. So I, 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 from there, I'm, I'm assuming that he allows them to do things as long as it's not illegal or things like that. <laughs> well, what do you think, Mary? Or is he an illegal person? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. I agree. So Sean, in your book, you and Mary had some very interesting points on portfolio management. One area that I've always found interesting is when to exit an investment. So in your book, you outline that when a stock appears to be overvalued, selling is obviously a rational action. But Warren has seemingly gone against this during his career during certain times. So for instance, uh, Coca-Cola in the early 2000s um, was a PE of 40. And like you just said, you know, PE doesn't always matter because he's forward looking and looking to the future. But why do you think um, he held on to Coke during that time when it seemed overpriced to, you know, the naked eye? Hey everyone, I just wanted to take a quick moment here to tell you about this premium superfood shake I have recently fell in love with called Kachava. Kachava is made from plant-based ingredients to power everything you do and help you feel amazing. In every serving, you get a balanced blend of superfoods, nutrients, plant-based protein, adaptogens, antioxidants, and so much more. As if that wasn't enough, Kachava also tastes amazing, and it's helped them earn tens of thousands of five-star reviews. It's creamy, smooth, and it comes in these five delicious flavors. To make it, all you have to do is add water and a little bit of ice with two heaping scoops of your favorite flavor. Then shake it or blend it and have it ready in seconds. Personally, I like to drink Kachava as a quick and easy breakfast or even as an afternoon snack when I'm craving something healthy to help me fuel my workday. I'd encourage you to give it a shot too because they have a love it guarantee, meaning that if you don't love it for any reason, you can just get your money back. We Study Billionaires is thrilled to partner with Kachava as they're offering our listeners 10% off for a limited time. Just go to kachava.com slash WSB. That's spelled K-A-C-H-A-V-A and get 10% off your first order. That's kachava.com slash WSB. Okay, then again, my, for my opinion, understanding what Warren does, he always mentioned that the main job is to allocate capital. So I guess whenever he makes a decision of whether to buy or to sell, is where to best place that particular percentage of capital that he already invested in. So I guess even when Coca-Cola was uh, at a P of 40 plus, the, the question that I would assume that he asked himself is, if I take the money out from Coca-Cola, where else can I put it that gives me a higher yield? And, and if let's right. say there isn't a more obvious place to do that, just keep it in the place of Coca-Cola because he believes that four or five years later, you'll go higher up. Uh, he doesn't time right. the market. He doesn't know whether it's going to crash and things like that. So it's about allocation of capital. Yes, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for, the, for the listeners, maybe, maybe an easier guideline was this. That I, that I will ask myself based on uh, after reading uh, Buffetology and studying under Mary is, when we buy a business, we are buying a wonderful business at a fair price or hopefully an undervalued price. These are the two key reasons why you buy a business. So when do we actually sell it? Again, in my opinion, it is when these two reasons for buying is no longer valid. So first reason, wonderful business. If it is no longer a wonderful business, I will sell it. Now, this doesn't mean that the business is crashing. It may be, I think it's wonderful because it is at a growth stage and it may, has, it may, has, it may have hit a plateau. So example, I think years back, I was buying McDonald's and after I realized, wow, they can't really expand much. Again, my own assessment. So I think it is no longer as wonderful as I want it to be. I, I exit at a good profit. Another thing is it may be a wonderful business, but the price is no longer so attractive, but it's really overvalued. But again, like I mentioned, where, where, where else can I put that money? If I can find a better investment, I'll put it somewhere else. If not, uh, the decision may be just to save it. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Excellent. So Mary, um, in a previous interview you had, you talked a little bit about how value investors like having a little bit of cash lying around in case big opportunities arise for them. So Buffett has taken that to the extremes as Berkshire Hathaway now has uh, $107.38 billion or so in cash on its balance sheet. So for investors who do have cash uh, available, but aren't ready to deploy it into an investment, what are some short-term investments they can make today to continue earning interest on those cash positions? 
Huh. Um. Yeah. Where are you putting your hundred billion dollars, Mary? Like. <laughs> uh, I I don't know what I would say to that. I mean, um, yes, this is about ready and joy. Uh, short trip investments. Um, the banks like what was the, what's the bank rate in in US right now? What is the what? The bank the bank rates like the interest rate the bank gives you. In Singapore, it's about three. You can go up to three percent, but it it still yeah. loses to inflation. But it, it slows down the rate of, uh, really. Like the money depreciating, like what, what is it right now? I don't, I don't really know. It it changes, but uh, short term investments they can make. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, I like cash. I mean, I I don't put it in in short term investments. I only like long term investments, or I have it in cash waiting for something to put it in. Um. So, uh, yeah, no, no short-term investments for me. And how about you, Sean? Um, if you had cash on the sidelines and didn't like the prices of some of the things that uh, you saw, are you do, following in, in uh, Mary's footsteps there and just leaving in cash? Or do you have some sort of short-term strategies that you like to use? Mm. Usually I would just put it with my wife to make her a happy wife. No, but jokes aside, uh, what, what happens is I do, I am, I'm always exploring. So I do have certain amount of money set aside, which I call it an education fund. Now, I mean, in some sense, when I say education fund, means I'm investing into things that I don't really truly or fully comprehend, but I just really want to test them out. So, so I, do, I do set aside a certain portion of it to test it out. Uh, maybe call it a venture capitalist fund, which I know is a pretty high risk. But, but I do use like options, writing of options, getting some cash uh, from there. But I write really, uh, I'm not sure whether the audiences are familiar familiar with the idea of options, writing cash secured put options that is really out of the money to make a certain percentage every single month or every week. That's something I like to do. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with that. So I even tested putting a certain small amount into, uh, okay, what do you call that? I know if you hold USDC coins, they give you some staking amounts. I, I do like to test all this. Again, I, I, I call it my education fund. I don't put too much into it. The rest, as what Mary mentioned, put into cash. Uh, waiting for the, the the big, I would say, great sale, okay, where, where the stocks are really cheap. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, right right now, as of now, I think he, he did mention that he has a problem finding good ideas. Uh, but for the investment, uh, the insurance float-wise, from, from what I read, even from Geico, uh, I mean, the, the, the statements of Berkshire, the way, there, there's a certain percentage you do need to keep aside. You do need to set aside. Uh, you cannot, like, Invest every single cent and oops, someone needs to claim for the uh, broken leg and, and you say, can you like wait for, wait for me to liquidate some of the... So it doesn't happen that way. There's a certain uh, multiplier effect or a certain reserve that they keep. I, I think there's a particular term they use. I, I can't remember uh, offhand. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it is not uh, something that they can spend totally. Uh, so patience and discipline has been a key attribute that Warren Buffett has expressed in large amounts throughout his investing career. But the average investor seems to have a very hard time consistently being patient and disciplined. What would be your advice to investors looking to improve their patience and discipline for the long run? Wow. Uh, I guess I, my advice would be to, to look back at what, you know, what you did or didn't do uh, and, in terms of investing and realize that if you had patience and discipline, you might have done something different. You could have held on to stocks longer. Um, it's, it's patience and discipline are, are a very, very difficult, you know, their personality. I mean, you, it's part of your personality. Warren is patient. He's obviously very disciplined. Um, but, you know, I, I would say, yeah, I mean, they, it, I, I think it's very hard to learn those attributes. You know, um, you can practice, uh, you know, but I think either you're patient and, and 
by being patient, you're, it's, it's a form of discipline. I, I think it's very hard to be patient and disciplined if you're not already doing it. And I think it's worse nowadays because, you know, last time, you, you think about Netflix, you see, they, they, they allow you to binge watch all the shows at one time. I mean, in the past, you have to wait for the next episode, the next week, you see. So I think it's getting worse uh, for people uh, like learning to wait for things to happen. It's getting worse. At the same time, I was also thinking because, you know, like I told you, my, my kids bought into stocks. They are not extremely patient people per se, but they don't really bother me about, about the stocks. They just say run. They ask me once in a while, how is it? I show them. And they, okay, sure. It, 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 they, they, they have the attributes of very strong investors. And I realize why is it so? Because it's not their money, you see. So, so I, I mean, when I, when I come back to think about it, I think that when your money is being put in a stock market, a lot of emotions is being involved. And uh, it goes into an extreme, especially if it's money you cannot afford to, to lose. Correct. It's, it's just that you, you can be a very good surgeon, excellent, but when you're like, operating on someone you really love and the risk is very high, suddenly you go crazy. So it, I, I guess it is contextual. Maybe for a start, for beginners, try to put aside money that you can lose. But it should not be something that you can lose and don't feel anything. You feel a bit of pin, pinch of, uh, a bit, bit of pinch of pain, but you can lose them so you don't, you don't make silly decisions. And when you realize that you can make wise de decisions as an investor, you add on to the, to the amount that you invest. It's like, it's like putting on weights, right? You, you become stronger and stronger. But initially, I guess the amount affects your patience and discipline. That, that, that's my, that's my uh, I would say, hypothesis. I'm not sure. What do you guys think? Yeah, I, I don't. Go, yeah, it, go on, Mary. Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, I, I think it's very hard to uh, teach people patience and discipline. I, I, I just think, you know, discipline is easier than patience. <laughs> discipline yeah, that makes is sense. easier than patience. Yeah. Maybe you just like, for your kids, just, just buy them a lower like internet plan, then they have to keep loading their website. I don't know, something like that. Just, just coming up with ideas. Yeah, so Sean, you you mentioned one thing earlier that that uh, just with the way the world is now, um, with technology being so prevalent, it's a lot easier to be distracted. And you know, it seems like um, people's ability to delay gratification is is uh, at a, at an all time low. Um, so with that said, though, um, I know some people like changing their environments a little bit, like whether that's you know, not checking oh, their yes. portfolio often or, um, you know, just removing apps that, that are going to make them make silly decisions. Do you have any suggestions of, uh, you know, kind of environmental factors that people can do, whether that's technology or whatever that, that can, that can help them? Um, I, I guess it, like, like Mary said, it's hard to improve patience and discipline, right, but just things right. that can, that can, that can help you make less poor decisions. I, I'm tempted to say to like really cancel your Netflix subscription, but my, my son is a shareholder, so uh, I shouldn't suggest that. <laughs> no, but I guess, I guess like uh, nowadays people are becoming more aware that we have this issue. And I think like even practicing mindfulness, uh, doing meditation, all these things helps. As you mentioned, really don't check your phone immediately each time. Just, just set it aside and have a certain, it goes back to discipline, right? Mary said that discipline is easier than patience. So you set aside certain discipline to train your patience. Like every day, only certain periods in time, you check your phone and stuff like that. Yeah, so I, I don't have a straight answer for that, but I guess it's, it's really becoming aware and then making sure whatever that triggers your emotion to want to immediately get something, the instant gratification component of it, aim to manage it. Know that it's there and aim to manage it. Yep. Mm. Yeah, I like that. So you mentioned meditation there. So do you, do you have like a meditation framework that you use on a regular basis or is it kind of just whenever because i know a lot of people do it uh, i haven't done it i haven't done it with any regularity yet mm -hmm. but i'd like to incorporate it so how would you go about incorporating that if uh, if you were brand new to meditating specifically in re reference to uh improving yourself as an investor okay uh i i go extreme a little bit because for me when i try to do something like even meditation i'll go a bit extreme so i i, I Okay, this is not an advertisement. It's not paid. Uh, I'm not paid to say this. But I bought this particular uh, headband called Muse, M-U-Z-E. 
where they give you biofeedback on how calm your mind is. So it's, it's quite funny. You put it on, you put on your, your earpiece, you, are, you hear like maybe rainfall. You can, choose, you can choose the ambience sound that you want. It can be rainfall, can be forest sound. And when your mind is very cluttered, the rainfall heavier. That's where you realize you have to relax. So there's actually practice of uh, relaxing your mind. This helps you as an investor because you become aware that you're making decisions when you are like having a cluttered mind. You are doing things without thinking through. You, you become very aware how your brain is operating when there's a biofeedback. So using technology, interestingly, technology is the one that causes a lot of us to become very impatient. But now you can use technology to, to counter this as well. I like that. So Mary, from observing Warren for so many years, um, what attributes do you think that he has that might not be widely known from the people outside of his personal circle that, that, you, can, uh, that you can share with the audience here? What attributes? Mm. Uh, I think, I mean, he reads an incredible lot. He's constantly reading. I mean, I, I'm trying to think if he's not watching TV, he's reading. You know, he's always in that office and his back office and, you know, reading something, looking at something. Um, and or you know he'd be on the phone. I remember I think when Kay Graham was alive, he'd be talking to Kay or and obviously Charlie. Uh, but yeah, reads everything. You know, that's a, an important thing. You know because it, we we all need to do that. But what does he read? Who knows? It's probably you know, about the companies, about their competitors. Um, yeah, just a lot of reading. <laughs> and Sean, you mentioned that you've, have you, you've met, you've met Warren before? Uh, at the AGMS, only at, at the, the AGMS, AGMS. Not, not personally. Yeah. Got you. Got you. And, um, how many of the, uh, do you go to the AGMs every year? Uh, quite often. Uh, okay, I went there. Oh no, actually, I went there once only. <laughs> I realized that. Well, after that, uh, there's the, the there's a Yahoo streaming, and I I just I just watched the Yahoo streaming. Yeah, yeah I know that. Uh, to get to get to Omaha, even even for me from Vancouver, it take, takes forever. So I I can't imagine how hard it is for you to get there. It must be like twenty four hours or something. Oh, that's right. And you have to book the accommodation way in advance. The whole place is. By the time I go to the AGM, it's actually quite tiring. The whole the whole place is cold. <laughs> so watching from the comfort of home is uh, much nicer nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> are you plan are you planning on going again at some point in the future? Mm, maybe next year, but more of just just for fun, you know. Right. Excellent. Mary, Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience connect with you and learn more about the two of you, your book, and your online academy? Well, marybuffett.com for me. Oh. Yeah, uh, you can search for Sean Sia at, uh, on Facebook as well. And you can also look for Buffett Online School. That's where we teach uh, the ideas of what uh, Warren is doing. And, and do, look, do read Mary's books. They are the books that actually got me started into investing. Yeah, and just so for the audience, for Sean, just his last name is S-E-A-H, just so you know. Oh, that's right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kyle. Yeah, when we went out to lunch, when we visited Buffett, I sat right across from him. The only question I really had for Warren was, how do you value a company? And, and Warren goes, the discounted cash flow. And so I, I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for more. I ask him again, I go, hey, you know, how do you value a company, Warren? <laughs> and he said the same thing, it's this kind of cash flow. So I knew that that had to be in the book. 